I just kind of always been like, yeah, Joel, he's the guy that make, makes people that are known across the country, known across the world. Like, that's <laughs> like, like how I describe it, but I don't really know how you describe it. Well, I mean, I, I use the title of global consultant because I'm basically advising studio owners all around the world. But really, I'm I'm a former owner turned advisor, right? Okay. I, I inspire creatives how to crush it in business. Cool. Welcome to Frame One. I'm Dryson. Today I'm hanging out with Joel Pilger of RevThink. Uh, Joel, first and foremost, thank you so much for being on Frame One today. Sure, good to uh, be here. Yeah, just just to kind of give you the quick brief synopsis. Frame One. The goal is to kind of explore your emotional journey from studio ownership to exiting the studio to starting a consulting group. Um, I didn't bring notes. I didn't really prep or prepare. So wherever this conversation goes, it goes. It's just kind of a Casual so saying, hangout. Emotional journey. So get ready for some tears. I hope so. If you make and, me cry, I'm going <laughs> to. I get a prize, right? I get a get gold a star. If I, get a prize. Get if a I make prize. you cry, I'll cry easy. I'm, I'm one of those. I'm, I'm a big softie. <laughs> so let's go back to the very beginning. You have an idea. I'm going to be a studio owner someday. Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm thinking back to, so I graduated from Georgia Tech in industrial design, but I'd always been entrepreneurial as a kid. And I mean from like age six or seven, me and a best buddy, Mike, across the street, we had 30, 40 crazy little entrepreneurial ventures that we did over the years. I was just one of those kinds of kids. So for me, by the time I graduated from college, I was already like, well, when am I going to do the grown-up version yeah. of some sort of a business? That was just the way I was wired. My parents were also super, super supportive. So I, I uh, started working in industrial design as a freelancer in Atlanta, started getting into computer graphics as a way to visualize designs. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this computer graphics thing, this is cool. And by the way, we can animate this stuff. That's cool. Got started working in that. And then shortly thereafter, I said, what if I actually launched a studio? Maybe I could like run the, do this as a business. And fortunately, I had my very first job right out of the gate was I <laughs> I got a, a lead on the Charlotte Hornets, the NBA team. They were producing a new show opener for their broadcast television games and all that. And I went in and pitched them and said, you guys should do an opener like this. And they said, oh my God, we love this. And they bought it. And so right out of the gate, my first project was this you know, by, by today's standards, probably a $50,000 job for this national, nationally recognized franchise. And so right out of the gate, my company does this project and everyone is like, whoa, what, this who, come yeah, what's, who, who's this and so forth. So that's where I started the company and that's how it started. Yeah. So talk to me about that first initial team. Uh, was it just you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, team. There was like, there was the animator, that was me. There was the designer, that was me. There was a producer. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, it was very much me uh, solo for a couple years. When I decided, like in that first year, I said, uh, I decided to move to Colorado. Okay. Because that had long been a dream. And moved out here, had two partners at that time. That didn't work out, so they, they bailed. So for a short period of time, there were some business partners. But then I was back to being solo here in Colorado, like which is where we are right now here mm -hmm. at Camp Mograph. So it's always good to be back in my adopted home state but i didn't grow the team for several years i had a you know junior animator with me for a little while and then a full-fledged mid-level 3d animator with me for a while it wasn't until to be honest it was seven years before i started to really grow the company and i would say and before i was really successful or thriving it was an extremely painful and difficult journey those first seven years. You know, from the outside looking in, people would be like, oh, Joel, you're so awesome, and you're doing all that cool work, and that's so great. But I was kind of running myself into the ground. I was unfulfilled, and I just wanted to reach for this next level that I yeah. sensed was out there and possible. Um, but that didn't really kick in until year seven. Okay, okay. So talk, I want to go ahead and go back to that first project real quick. Okay. Um, being that entrepreneurial person and being, let's say, brave enough to walk in and pitch an idea, mm -hmm. did considering that project would have been a $50,000 project in today's money, was it a $50,000 project in $94 you know, dollars and cents? No, I think it was like 30000 or so in those dollars. So somebody smart, do the math, right? Um, after inflation, it's probably today 
I say figure about 50, but it was, um, it was a really cool experience because when I, I, I think I met these people and I said, Hey, I have this idea. I would love to pitch this to you. Of course I didn't actually have an idea, right? but I knew I could come up with one. Okay. So unbeknownst to them, they're like, yeah, we'd love to see your idea. You know, come in two weeks from Wednesday and share what you've got. So I sit down and I just start drawing and scribbling and taking some of my industrial design chops, my abilities to draw and sketch and drew a storyboard on pa- pencil and paper and went in and just said, check this out. And they all were like, whoa, you can do this? I'm like, heck yeah. And I showed them <laughs> some of my work so they could see, oh, okay, I guess you do that animation thing. Now this is 94. So we're talking about a period in time like where- Like Toy Story just came out. Yeah. <laughs> like this is just after Jurassic Park. This is around Toy Story. So if you could do anything in 3D that showed lighting and I don't know, any kind of visual effects, people were like, whoa. Uh, so in a way, the combination of that engendered confidence, the storyboard made them say, wow, this is amazing. And they said, go. And uh, I got, I don't know, I guess I got the first half and got started. Hired a friend of mine that I knew I was going to need, you know, went across town and rented the high end computer and software that I needed to, yep. in order to do the work Yep. and uh, made it happen. It was like a, oh, it was like a two month process. It took a month just to render it. What I'm, what I'm interested in is the fact that your first project, being that entrepreneurial person, came in at $30,000 uh, in 94. Mm-hmm. A lot of people in today that are just starting studios and starting up will be like, I just need a $5,000 project, a $10,000 sure. project. Sure. So I'm curious, what gave you the, the bravery to kind of come out swinging for the fences like that? Ah, uh, that's such a good question. So first of all, I love that you just used the phrase swing for the fences, because we'll come back to that. Okay. All right. Um, I think, I mean, part of it was I had been involved in business and as a freelancer and had done a lot of crazy kind of entrepreneurial whatever things. So I kind of knew when I'm thrown into something, I can kind of make it up. I can figure it out. Okay. I can be scrappy and, yeah. and be resourceful and make something happen. Um, how did I dare to go in with like that kind of a number? I think at the time... This is going to sound so like pedestrian. I think I said, what's my time worth? Because you say, well, okay, I've been making this much as an employee and this much essentially per hour. You know, what if I, what if I, I don't know, doubled that roughly because now I'm a freelancer. Yep. And it's going to take me, if I'm going to do this project, it's probably going to take me about this much time. Then I'm going to have to hire my buddy who's going to do that. And he's going to spend 30 or 40 hours of this. And I just kind of said, Dang, I think this thing is like almost thirty thousand dollars to do this. Which day for you is like, whoa, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah, I think at the time, if I'm honest, I think my salary was just a little bit more than that. Okay. I think my salary was like in the high thirties. I could make a whole year in a month. I could make a whole year in a month, and, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I had other like, com- comparative data at the time. Like, yeah. oh, this is what the going rate is, or any of that. I think. And this is a lesson I've practiced my entire career. I now teach this to, to my clients and, and fans of, you know what, go in, swing for the fences, right? Like people who are starting out and they think, oh, I got to start small and so forth. I'm like, yes. However, you really owe it to yourself to make a little bit of time and space and swing for the fences. And that was how, like, I just kind of propelled my company right out of the starting gates with that win So, yeah, the answer is, I mean, a combination of confidence, I don't know, a little bit of bravado, maybe a little bit of ego, some, maybe a little bit of naivete, you know, because by the time the project was done and I added up all the numbers, I did, I did okay, but wow, it was way more work than I expected it was going to be. It tends to go that way. It tends to go that way, especially, yeah, when you're inventing something for the first time, you know, you, you look back later and you say, oh, I thought I was going to spend 80 hours on this. I spent 180. Right. You're like, right. okay, I didn't exactly make super bank on that, but. So you, you start this fun project, you keep just grinding and chugging away for seven years. At what point were you like, this is, this is a lot of work. I need to hire somebody as a full-time employee. Well, I remember one moment where it was, I was working on a project for Ford through their agency, JWT, and it's just me, and I'm in my studio, and I've got, I don't think, three Silicon Graphics workstations, and we're, I'm building something in Softimage, which was the 3D software of the, of that era, and it's 
nine o'clock at night. I remember my then wife was like, where are you? Why aren't you home yet? I'm like, I got to get this thing rendering because it's going to render all night. This was the way we did things. Okay. Be home soon. Yeah. And then it's 11 o'clock and it's, I'm still not ready to hit the render button. It's 12 o'clock. Okay. I think I'm about ready to hit the render button and I hit the render button and I get the dreaded soft homage internal error, which is the equivalent of like the blue screen of death. Like, oh no, it's not going to render. I spend the next three or four hours, I don't even remember, getting into the place where it can finally render. And I'm thinking, this is my life, man. It's three or four in the morning. I should be home. I should be with my family. I should just like, this can't be my life. And it was like, you know, sure, I have, quote, freedom. But I feel like sometimes I've built almost like a... A slavery where you're a slave to the business. Yeah, like I've built a, uh, I've built brick by brick this thing around me, and now I look around and I'm like, is this a jail cell or is this a... Right? Yep. The door is always open. I can leave any time, but still I feel kind of trapped. Yep. Um, and so at that time I just had this sense, because I can remember literally being in tears, right? I you told, I told you I was you're going to make me cry. <laughs> now I remember being so exasperated in that moment when I was like seeing that soft image internal air and I was just like damn it this, I'm like, how can ah, I can't this can't be my life and that was when I just basically made a decision the next day of I've got to do something different and sh- short period of time after that I brought on my first employee I also started going through entrepreneurial coaching I moved the studio into downtown Denver brought on a business partner. I mean, I can tell you all these other things, but I started making some major shifts. It was an intentional pivot point. It wasn't just, okay, I'm busy. Let's hire somebody. Correct. I like that. Correct. So because you had that moment of, of F this for lack of a better term, what was the immediate results, uh, for the, for the business growth as far as now we have an additional resource here. We have somebody here. I can have more time pitching, talking to people, building relationships, or was it just, no, I've got someone who can hit render at midnight? Well, let's see. I would say the results really started to show up. Let's fast forward maybe about a year. Okay. Because moving the businesses into downtown Denver, I had approached, this was a huge move, by the way, right? I mean, I'm moving 80 miles up from Colorado oh, Springs okay. To, okay, yeah. to, into downtown Denver, leasing a space in downtown Denver. Which is not cheap. Right? I have now a business partner. I have a, a th- full-time 3D animator. We even hired an assistant, like, call it producer at the time. This was all, like... That's a lot of growth in a year. This was a lot of gambling, right? There's a lot of gambling, right? We also bought a, a digital beta cam deck at the time that was, I don't know, thirty or $40,000. All this, right? But the reason I did that was because... I approached this agency, JWT, in downtown Denver and said, hey, we've worked together. I think I want to move my studio right down the street from you guys. Would that be a good idea? And they were like, hell yes. Meaning we would love to work with you more if you were right here. That became like just a core base account. So when we moved into town, I knew I had enough resources to say to someone like JWT, come into our studio, it's furnished, we have a flame suite. We have an edit suite. We have, I mean, it was all band-aids and duct tape yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. But I was make, making this gamble called, if we can just land this piece of business from this agency, I think that'll provide enough money for us to <laughs> reach this next level. And that provided the foundation for me to start swinging for the fences at the next level. But it was very much because having that team gave me the ability to, it's what I call focus on my genius. So rather than being the guy in the chair that was doing the 3D all the time now, and the guy that was doing all the editing and the whatever, I was able to go out and start meeting people, building relationships. We, we, we won a lot of business from Dish Network, which mm-hmm. was there in town in Denver, and so on and so on. But this idea of, it's really a classic division of labor concept that you know we know from, uh, is it Adam Smith? What's the who's the economic guy that invented father of economics um, concept. And, but my being, my being able to focus and not wear 32 hats. I remember one time listing all of the different things it took for me to run my business and being able to say, let's just get that down to 12 and then maybe six things. And then maybe someday three or four things. And that's 
very much the trajectory over the next 20 years that unfolded. I love that. I want to step back to that that year transition period because to go from, you know, mid, work until midnight, just suck, to having all this stuff moving to the, the studio downtown Denver within a year, mm-hmm. the financial stress of a gamble like that could not have been just a, no, nah, it'll be fine. No, it wasn't. But I, I will also say this, I can get really practical and really honest with folks here, is that was not a, I didn't take on serious debt because I always knew, okay, if we can go out and win this job, then I'm going to hire that person immediately. So I'm going to have that person kind of in the wings, waiting in the wings, or, oh, we've got to buy this expensive tape deck that's $40,000 or something. Well, I'm not going to buy that and hope the job lands. Uh Uh-uh. I'll have it all ready to go. And then when we land that $20,000 spot that I know is going to turn into three or four more of those, and then the revisions, and then the tags, and the, okay, we landed that job, boom. So we were always very shrewd and frugal. We always dealt with things on a cash basis. If we ever put anything on a credit card, we knew that check is coming in on that date, and we're paying that sucker off. It, we didn't even get a line of credit, I think, for probably another five or ten years. So we were always operating from a cash basis. So yes, scary and those are big commitments but i don't know i think something i've learned especially in the in the years that followed and i now teach this to a lot of my my clients as business owners is we get really spun up about making these commitments like yeah. hiring somebody you know signing a lease um buying that piece of equipment whatever some of those things are not easily unwound Okay, when you sign a lease, okay, I get it. I'm going to be very cautious with you and say, you know, Dryson, let's let's really pause here before we sign this. But when you buy a piece of gear, when you hire a person, there is kind of an undo button. What I was taught by my coach, who was this uh, guy, Dan Sullivan, was he said, Joel, you can try anything for 90 days. And I would approach decisions like, okay, can I try this? Can I, can I make this gamble and see what it looks like in 90 days? And if it's not working, pull the plug. What that did over time was it gave me a bias towards action and towards what's possible, what might happen. Because we, as human beings, we immediately go to, well, this could suck. Like this could really suck and this could be really expensive and there could be a lot of regret. Okay, got that. But what if you're right? What if it actually does play out? What if it leads to something you don't even see yet? And that bias towards, I don't know, an optimism and, and what's possible and, hey, I can try this for 90 days has obviously served me very well. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm reflecting back onto the interview that I had with Aaron Swarovski and we were talking about how the first couple of years felt like one thing and then it kind of went to a different phase and then a different phase. And I'm kind of noticing a similar trend where those first seven years were, you know, baby impossible pictures. I call them my ashes years <laughs> to reference the old Cinderella classic. And then it sounds like the true startup years is like, you know, when we started bringing people on and having that entrepreneurial switch. What was the next big phase of the of, of impossible pictures? Well, um, kudos to Erin. I think she's amazing. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed getting to know her. And I know some of that story, which is very, very cool. Yeah, the, the, the next phase was that post seven years so years eight and beyond. That season was, I would say, where we grew from, you know, call it two or three people to around a dozen. And what that season was marked by was there's like, there's a new kid in town in a sense that, hey, Joel and my partner, Steve, those are those two guys that are in town and they're doing really cool work. And we were also doing work for clients far outside of Denver. Yeah. We were starting to do TV network rebrands and doing promo work for entertainment companies and, and things like that. And so I think when I look back, I think of there's, there's this photo I'm, I'm remembering where, of course, we would occasionally do some sort of a mailer or a promotional thing or we're going to host a happy hour or those kinds of things. And I remember taking this picture of our team. And I think there were... 12 of us at the time and we just all kind of lined up and 
some photographer took a picture of us and then we put it into some sort of a, a mailer or an email or something that went out and was like, hey, looking forward to seeing you at the happy hour. And I remember one of my clients who came to the happy hour was like, man, you guys are, uh, you know, you guys are kind of crushing it and so forth. And he referenced this photo of yeah. all of us standing there. And he just kind of made a remark about, hey, you guys kind of have this like swagger, like kind of badass looking. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of you had your arms crossed and, you know, we're looking at the camera. And I just kind of laughed because, you know, we we're just all sweethearts and, and friendly people. But it was that moment when I realized, oh, yeah, I, I guess we're kind of doing it. And we're, we're, we're gaining the respect of our, of our industry, of, of our clients, you know, of the, of the community there in Denver. And yeah, I think it was, it was very much marked by this was the first time that the company was the producing the kind of work that I knew we were always capable of. That's awesome. And that it's funny cause that, that actually makes me a little bit emotional to say that because man, <laughs> when you're on that journey and you're in that seven years, you're like, shit, I know I'm capable of something greater. I feel called to make it. It's this thing that just, it, it drives me. And it, it, at times it drives me crazy. At times it drives the people that I love crazy because I have this sort of obsession. Absolutely. Right? And it's not just producing the great work, but it's also produce, you know, generating great money. And it's generating the like attention and respect that you you know you you I don't want to say you deserve it almost be an addiction yeah chasing that yeah yeah absolutely and so when you start to to finally scratch that itch and enjoy some of that satisfaction that's a cool season of your business I'm excited to get there someday <laughs> <laughs> yes I, I am I am as well uh, so I want to kind of look at the whole of Impossible Pictures from from starting up with just you to bring in everybody on board. What was the peak as far as uh, people or top revenue bringing in of of your season there? Sure. So we peaked um, around five million a year. We had a full time team of twenty five people. What's remarkable though, I remember at that time we were working with a lot of freelancers and crew because mm -hmm. we were doing live action projects and things like that. And I remember one when, when you're going to my bookkeeper and said, Hey, how many, you know, how many people are we working with freelance? And he came back and he said, Oh, do you mean like post freelancers? And I said, well, no, all freelancers, like including crew. He came back and he said, ah, 203. Whew. <laughs> and I, that's when I was like, okay, whoa, something's happening here because this size team and that size network of freelancers, like, wow, that's a lot of activity. So that's kind of what it looked like. And I would just say, the composition of our of our team there was myself and my partner i was more i was very focused on business development and marketing and running the company yeah my partner was really a director slash creative director uh and then i had a, several creative directors on staff several senior designer animator types senior editor colorist uh i had probably three producers maybe four producers including an executive producer senior producer middle producer uh coordinating producer because i love producers if you can't tell they're the unsung heroes of our industry i'm just going to say that uh and then there were a few other operations people so you know office manager had an operations uh vp and uh could you know finance uh controller i might be forgetting somebody else but that was that was the, that was the look of the team and and there were i i should i should say there were probably another eight or 10 people in there that I would just say are motion designers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sort of the bulk of the creative team, if you will. So I, I've talked to a few owners over the years, and there's a trend that I've noticed where sometimes people have an idea of, I want to be this $5 million, $10 million, $15 million studio. They get out there, they achieve it, and they're like, this is not what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, did you ever feel that? Yes. It took me a while because I will say this, first of all, I can remember when it was just me and I thought about, man, if we land this project with Disney, which we did, it was very exciting. I thought, oh, who knows what could happen? Maybe a year from now, we might be like six or seven people. And in my mind, I imagined a, a room with six or seven animators in it, Yeah, which was super naive. Like as I grew, it wasn't six or seven animators that I hired. That was that you can't run that company. So it's funny how we have these pictures in our mind that are I don't know what they're based on. They're not based on any reality. As my 
sort of company grew, it was, it, it just looked very different than what I ever pictured. When I got to the point where we were 25 people, if I'm very honest, even though it was exciting because we were growing, it was exciting because we had a lot of, um, I would say we had a lot of expertise and a lot of capacity. Like we could tackle really cool problems. Yeah. Like we could do a, a million dollar job. That's a, that's an exciting thing when you can say like, look somebody in the eyes and say, yeah, we can do that. And you know, you're making a promise that you're going to deliver on at that scale. That's very exciting, uh, right? Scary, imagine a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm looking at my buddy Mitch here in the distance. Like, <laughs> There's also the moment when you're like, oh, shoot, careful what you wish for. Because after you shake that person's hand, there's probably a moment about three or four weeks into the future where you're going to be on set and everything is on you. And you suddenly realize, wait a minute, we're burning $300,000 in one day. And if this person doesn't show up or if that light falls in that person's head, if we don't have the proper insurance coverages, you know, did we get the paperwork signed with whatever the union, non-union? I mean, it's you're like, making me nervous to sit. Here. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you know, it's exciting, but you're also like, whoa, I just thought it would be really cool to do this high level, high end work. Yeah. When you're actually in the moment and you're dealing with all the realities of what it takes, it's an, an enormous responsibility, right? Because you've got clients on the one hand that are needing all of this. Hey, we're paying you. You guys had better deliver and it better be top not, notch. People it better get fired. Be, yeah. And then you also have your team, your freelancers, your crew, and they're all saying, hey, um, give me what I need yeah. to do a really good job. And of course, pay me and I'd like a raise. I want a promotion. My benefits aren't very awesome. You know, this healthcare plan sucks. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. So once I got to 25 people, I think there was, if I'm being really honest, there was a moment when I realized I think I was happier when we were like 15 to 20 people. And now this is different for every owner. I've, I know some owners that are at their happiest when their team size is three. I know some that are at 53 and they're still excited about growth. They're excited about the layers and the bureaucracy and the departments and all these kinds of things, right? And we have some people in our, in our industry that cross over 100 and we have several that are several companies that are in the sev several hundred people. Personally, I look at them and I think, that's crazy. I would never want to do that. But to the people that aspire to that and can handle those trade-offs, they love it. I'm like, Hey, more power to you, man. How can I, how can I help you and support you? Cause if you have a dream, I, you know, I feel like I'm called to enable and, and help, uh, achieve that. Is that your genius? I guess so. I mean, nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, it's Tim, my, my partner, I think often says it this way that as he says, as Joel went along, and learned everything, he remembers how he learned it. So therefore he's able to like Dissect access it. it and bring it back, you know, and bring it back and share it with others. Um, so that's his observation. But I, I think that's, that's probably a good indicator of genius. It's very often the thing that you take for granted because to you, it's just normal, right? This is just what Dryson does. Other people look at it and they go, no, no, no. <laughs> when you do that thing, dude, you are like awesome. That's your superpower. Um, so a lot of times that is a, a, a sign of help that helps you that ident does, identify your genius. My, my gear spinning just a little bit, just right. a little bit. Uh, so on frame one, you are the second owner that we've talked to that's exited a, bu a business and sold it, had, had to be acquired. Mm -hmm. I am curious, what was your reasoning for that? Well, the, 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 the inflection point was that around year 18, 19, I was pivoting yet again. And for anyone in business, you've probably experienced this where it feels like every three years, maybe every four years, mm -hmm. you're having to, wow, like something's changing. I'm being disrupted. I'm having to pivot and shift and whatever. And that's in a way it's difficult and painful, but it's also exciting. But I had done that now, I don't know, five or six or seven times or yeah. something. And I didn't find myself relishing it around year 18 or 19. And I had, I had parted ways with my business partner. Our we had reduced our team size. And I was trying to figure out, well, where do, where, where do I want to go next? And I had this crazy idea. I approached a good friend of mine 
Ryan Bramwell, who is the former owner of Spilt, which is now yep. Ed's company, who's been on your podcast. And I approached Ryan at the time and said, dude, I've always been a big fan of you and your studio. We're good friends. I'm thinking like, you guys should acquire Impossible or Impossible should acquire you and we should join forces because we would be so awesome and wouldn't that be exciting? And I can remember him like taking a bite of his sandwich and just kind of like shaking his head. And he wasn't excited at all about it. And I thought, <laughs> I was like, I'm like, dude. We're buddies, let's do it. Yeah, come on. Like, get on board of this, this train. Isn't this exciting? And he, he said, hmm, no, Joel, I don't get it. What I'm hearing is you have basically accomplished at Impossible Pictures everything you set out to do. You just don't know what to do next. And it was that like lightning bolt when a good friend who, you know, who, who loves you is telling you to your face, hey, dude, here's the reality. And that's when I realized, oh, right. Now what? Another good friend gave me good advice. She said, this is a season where you should just open yourself up to everything. Look, you have this amazing network, all these connections, all these people that respect you and appreciate you. Just reach out there and say, I'm opening myself up to whatever's next. Any shape, any size, any whatever. And I had a former client that when I shared that, he said, seriously? Because if I could, I would acquire Impossible Pictures because I want you to come on and be part of my C-suite, this company that I'm launching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at that, by the time this transpired, it was almost the 20 year mark to the day. And I said, okay, self, <laughs> uh, this could be the good moment to close this chapter. Yeah. And we shook hands on that deal and, and closed that chapter. And I, went on to work for that company for a period of time. And it's not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I'm just going to be, I'm going to totally level with you. So when I say acquired, trust me, it's not like there's a, I'm now this giant trust funder or something. Um, and we can, we can unpack that if you want, but that's the, that's the essence of the story. It, it sounds like at that point you had given yourself permission to think about other things. Yes. Which is, which is powerful. Yeah. Uh, do you want to dive into the, the, after the acquisition type thing, how, how, how open or not do you want to get into that? Yeah, I, I'm fine with sharing whatever, with, okay. whatever you find most okay, okay. interesting within our, within our time allotment. So I, I heard, I read somewhere either in one of our conversations or through RevThink that when you close the doors for in, Impossible, that there was a lot of debt that came along with that as well. Right. Talk to me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of my, uh, as, as Tim and I often say, this is one of my regrets that I had to manage because when you're running a business, the longer you go, you will, you will realize there's no way to live without regrets, but you can manage them. And one of the regrets I had to manage was by the time the, the business was getting to that point where it was going to be acquired, we had stacked, it's, it's, it's complicated to explain because when I say we had racked up a lot of debt, people often say, well, how is that possible? And how is this? It's way too boring and complicated to explain, but trust, it's things like cash flow and things like cash versus accrual accounting and t federal versus state taxes and incentives and insurances policies that didn't or didn't pay, yada, yada, yada. The long and short of it was we had a line of credit that we had always used when we would do like a live action shoot. We need a couple hundred thousand dollars to go do the shoot and then the client's going to pay us. And we use that. And over time, that line of credit didn't get zeroed out and zeroed out and zeroed out. It started to climb and climb and climb. So when the time finally came for me to shut the business, I was basically left holding the bag. There were no employees that were going to pay that. My partner and I had parted ways. So I was essentially stuck with that. I now know the lesson that I learned was one that's very simple. That is pay yourself first, right? And this sounds so like, fundamental and so elementary, you're going to laugh, but always uh, spend less than you make. Now, here's the thing. When you're running a $5 million a year business, it's incredibly how complicated that can be. It's really hard to track every penny, it's, every minute. It's, it's, let's just say it's, it, it can be complicated. Now, I've since learned a very simple way to manage it because after going through that experience, I was determined as a consultant. I was like, I'll be damned 
if I'm going to let any of my clients or anybody in our industry go through that unnecessarily. So there's now a whole method that inside of RevThink, which Tim Thompson, to his credit, developed a thing called the Factors Method and these other principles we call the creative firm operating system and so forth, that we don't let that happen to people. Uh, but that's the story. And yeah, what happened was several months after I shut down my business, and of course, I'm acquired, but I'm given stock options, which someday in the future might be worth something. But in the short term, the government is saying we need a few hundred thousand dollars and the bank is saying we need a few hundred thousand dollars and so on and so on. Let's just say that between that and closing the business and just going through what we go through in, in life and personal matters, it was one of the most difficult periods in my entire life. So when you, you face that kind of, of difficulty, how do you overcome? How do you say, okay, yes, this sucks, but pull up the bootstraps, figure things out, and move forward? I mean, that's it. I, I'm going to say, you, look, you lean, on, uh, you lean on friends a lot. You probably lean into family, um, depending on what kind of a family that you have. Um, I had a great relationship with my dad, and he was able to help. And so there were, there were a lot of moves, but I would say underneath it all that it's like this idea of, uh, how the old joke, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. One bite at a time. And what we know is the ways that we get into debt, it's very, this very sort of, um, incremental, bite by bite by bite and then you wake up one day and you're like oh my god i'm super massively in debt well the way you get out is the same way and it took a few years and a lot of um what humble pie because i spent two years um like being an ebay store selling off all the assets of from hard drives to video cards right to tape decks that was not fun that was not my genius but I did what I had to do to feed my family, to keep, you know, keep my kid in school, all this kind of stuff. And there's an underlying optimism that says, if we do the right things, the right things will happen. And I'm just going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep figuring it out. I'm going to keep creating value for people. And, and maybe also you have to, you know, like your ego takes a bruising because you're now doing things that you just thought maybe in the past when you had this glamorous business and all this stuff. You were like, well, I'm above that. And then when the time comes, you're like, you know what? I'm going back to these days when I was a Domino's pizza delivery driver, you know, and I mowed lawns in the summer and whatever. And I was a dishwasher at a country club and you realize, oh yeah, you know, when it's, when things get tough, you dig deep and you, you start doing the work and you show up and it's amazing how it's not going to change in a week or a month, but over a period of months and years, you'll get through it. I love it. I love it. So let's dive into RevThink. Okay. Tell me about the origins. How did that come to be? Well, that's a better question answered by Tim Thompson, but Tim founded RevThink. uh, I'm not even sure of the year, to be honest, which is a bit embarrassing, but I want to say it was late 2000s. He had been at the early days of Imaginary Forces, which before that was RGA. Um, he He worked on Seven with Kyle Cooper and some of these other famous projects that IF was doing in those days. But when he parted, he, he founded the company basically to help his friends yeah. that were running studios and coming to him and saying, where did all my money go? Because the, the tax man says we made a million dollars, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't see it. Yeah, I'm looking at my bank accounts and I don't see that million. In the process, um, he invented a method for managing production at scale and how to make sure that a company is always profitable no matter what. And that was really his... Uh, his bailiwick, like his his invention, which fueled him working with clients one on one over a number of years, number yeah. of years. When he and I started working together in probably 2012, 2013, yep. shortly before I I exited, uh, I knew, wow, Tim, if you had taught me this years ago, not only would I not be in debt, I'd I'd probably be a little bit rich. And then when I exited and I, and I was working for the company that had acquired Impossible, but I was very unhappy, he knew I was going to leave. And he said, you should come join me. And let's just say he won that argument because he, <laughs> because he was right. He saw something that, that I didn't really see myself. Um, and that was now, uh, that will be 10 years come this summer. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, it's been awesome. 
So what is the overall goal of RevThink? The goal, I, I say this, right? Until every creative business on the planet is thriving, our work is not yet done. So our goal is to come alongside owners and creative leaders and give them the tools, the methods, the principles that creative businesses need to thrive. And by creative businesses, our sweet spot is companies that produce content. So these are motion design, animation, uh, visual effects, production companies, sound design, experiential, immersive, gaming, right? These are all people that are creating stuff for clients on a project basis. And yeah, that's our, that's our why. I love it. I love it. So kind of walk me through as far as the studios you're bringing on are range anywhere from, from, uh, you make $100,000, $300,000 a year up to in the millions. Yep. But as far as someone that really wants to be like, okay, I need to get more out of this. Where's kind of that sweet starting point for like the best fit client for you? Well, the best fit clients for us, I would say it, it, it it was those companies that were probably, you know, five to $15 $15 million a year. And that's come down a little bit over the years as we've essentially just broadened yeah. the, the, the net. And that was partly because when I joined Tim, he was this fixer that was unknown to almost everybody in the industry. And I said, hey, if I'm going to join this thing, we're going to take all this awesome knowledge that we have and we're going to start giving it away. And we're going to like open it up and invite everybody into this. And of course, I'm a big, big believer in community. So now we have this community to which yep, you belong yep. and there's hundreds of other owners there but the um oh no i'm, I'm losing my thought the, the question was I'm losing my thought nick help yeah, us out the ideal, client. the ideal client oh right right the <laughs> ideal client um so the sweet spot for us now is probably a company that's between yeah is over a million you know between one and ten million I'll, I'll call it the starting point though is often a studio that might have two or three people they're probably generating three or four hundred thousand dollars a year and they know, like me, in my day, they know they're capable of so much more. And they're probably not paying themselves nearly enough. And they've probably been at it for several years, like me. I was at, at it for seven. And they're bumping up against wh- what I call, or, or I've heard called, the ceiling of complexity. Like, we don't have any idea how we can take on more work, more clients, because we're already stressed out. We're wearing all these hats. And... You know, there's just no way they can't see it. And what I see is, oh, we've got to unleash what you can't see. I can see. Let me let me help you reach this next level. And that next level is usually around a million dollars that once you get to that, things get really exciting. You start to find a lot more satisfaction. You're producing the kind of work that you want to produce. So it's it's that starting point is probably that doing, you know, call it four hundred. $500,000 Five hundred thousand dollars a year. Perfect sweet spot. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now I'm curious because there's a lot of ways to get to three hundred, four thousand dollars. You can do a lot of one thousand dollar projects, <laughs> or two two hundred thousand dollar projects. There you go. <laughs> I like that much better. Uh, how do you help people learn to qualify or to to obtain those? You know, the better ones. Yeah. Well, I'll let me go high for a second. Um, when Tim and I started first started kind of opening up uh, RevThink to a, to a larger audience. At that time, I had I had noticed a pattern where a lot of smaller companies were coming to me, maybe because they knew me through Impossible and so forth, and they would ask me for my advice. You know, hey, can we can we buy you dinner while you're in L.A.? We want to pick your brain and yeah. all these kinds of things. While you're at Camp Mulgraff, can I sit down and talk to you? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> which is great. You know, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to do that as much as I can. But what I found was after... You know, I would go back to those same guys, you know, six months later and say, hey, how's it going? You know, meaning all those things that I shared with you and taught you what's happening. And they would have this like, um, I remember you said something about what was it again? And that's when I realized uh, they're not able to catch these things that I'm throwing at them. Yeah. So the reason I'm telling you this story is at that time I realized, you know, in order for someone to reach this next level. So let's call it for the leap from roughly half a million up to a million. Yeah. There are, I don't know, six to eight major concepts that a studio owner needs to embrace. One of them is qualifying. Okay. So back to your question. But you can't just learn to qualify and that's enough. Yeah. Right. All these concepts kind of work in concert. It's things like pricing. It's, it's, it's qualifying, knowing when to say yes and when to say no. 
It's uh, how to shift from being the order taker to the expert. All these things work together. That ultimately formed this thing I said called, Tim, I want to create this thing called Jumpstart, which is a, an accelerator. It's a class that I want to take people through. He said, Joel, that's a terrible idea because that's just going to commoditize what we do. And it's, you know, all this. And I said, no, no, I think once you see it, you'll get it. And he did get it. He, he thought this was really tremendous. But qualifying is a piece of that. So I'm, what I was going to say is, don't think of qualifying as just one thing that you can do. It's like uh, the analogy of the three-legged stool, right? It's just one leg. Of, you need your creative. You need your finance. Yeah, it's like sales and production and, yep. and creative, right? Yep. It's that kind of a kind of a concept. But to answer your question, when I talk about qualifying, I reference what I call the three R's and the three D's. Each one of these is like a, a concept um, that's in the program I described. The three R's is answering the question. Why do we take on any given project right, or any given client, any given opportunity, let's call it, just an opportunity? And the filter goes like this, the real, the relationship, and the reward, meaning will this opportunity be something that creates something amazing for our real, our, yep. I mean, our portfolio? Will this be a relationship that's positive and ongoing that refers us that uh, appreciates us and respects us. And then, of course, uh, reward. Will this be financially profitable? Um, will they pay us on time, pay quickly, all these kinds of things. When you have those three things, that project is totally qualified. That opportunity, yes, go. That's one example of qualifying. And then the three Ds is, okay, now we ask the question, once we start talking to the actual client about actually getting started, we ask about the three Ds, which is the, the deadline, the decision maker, and the dollars, uh, and then the thing I call the shift. But anyways, that's that's a whole other concept <laughs> that we can get into. Absolutely, absolutely. So one thing I've, I've admired about you, the more I've learned about you, is you have a, an innate ability for positioning mm. and making sure that people like, you know, aren't just saying, we make videos. Right. <laughs> I'm curious if there's ever a time frame where that's not appropriate. And what I mean by that, is uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on Jay Allen a little bit. I love him very very much. Oh yeah, Jay at uh, Secret Powers. They have a a motto which I believe is forged in fun, uh, found in keyframes, revealed in keyframes, found in frames, found in frames. That's what yes. it is, and yes. I love it. It is fantastic. Right. Uh, but his studio is at a certain size where it's like they're able to to when people need motion graphics for video games, mm -hmm. they know what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with hyperfocus where, mm -hmm. where I'm at right now, mm -hmm. and uh, people don't know who we are right. so we're talking very literal so we have to be like we have to educate almost because we haven't proven yet yep is there a point where it's like you need to be literal or is it just come out of the gate and be no be creative super great question and props to jay when he uh shared that positioning with me i got really fired up and it's been really successful for him like he's very he's very proud of what that's how that's moved his business forward to answer your question, I would say, conceptually speaking, as a matter of principle, I find that great marketing is all about creating curiosity that leads to a conversation. But yes, at some point, there is what I, it's like a mental funnel. It's like a brain funnel where great positioning is going to make me curious. Huh, what's that? So when I see forged in fun, found in frames or... You know, we're kind of slightly butchering yep. it, right? I'm sure. <laughs> it makes me say, huh, I'm getting a sense of something. Plus, it's paired with a visual, right? Right, right. He's got these big characters like you would see in a video game or something. So yep. I'm, if I'm that kind of person that I love video games and the ethos that he's putting forward and I see those things and I see forged and something about frames and I'm like, huh, well, what is that? Okay, that's a win. I mean, that is great positioning right from the start. But to your point, it's not enough because you've made me curious, but I'm pretty soon, once I start scrolling down that page or I click on the about and I go to the about, I want you to also just tell me what the heck is it you do? Right, right. And if you don't tell me that, I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to say, I don't get it. I don't get it. That's, that's odd. That's confusing. So it's this idea of step one. It's usually this why, it's this mission, this purpose. It's a, it's an aspiration. It might be a rallying cry. It might be an anthem. These are all terms that I talk about when 
I talk about positioning. And coming up with that is so damn hard. Okay, just ask Jay. He labored over this for months and months and months and finally got it out. It took, I think it took him a year to get his full positioning and his new website and all this stuff done. But yes, that, that thing is going to make you curious. And then as you gradually are exposed to, well, who are these people and what are they about and what is it they actually do and how do they do it? And ans- those, those answers become increasingly literal. So that by the time you get to the bottom of this funnel, you kind of know why this company exists, but you also know what they do, how they do it, who they are. Like, oh, this is Dryson. This is, you know, his team. These are the, like, okay. And so when I get to the contact page and I see already executive producer, all. right, Susie Smith or whatever, it's like, that's a real person and I can click on that and it's going to send a real email to somebody on the other end named Susie who is going to answer my question and start helping me figure out how to get my project done. Thank you for explaining that because it's always been uh, something I'm like, it's it's a motto. It's, it's a slogan. That is, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. And to hear it's more of a, a complete one package branding thing or something designed to inspire curiosity, uh, you just kind of get the brain. It's an arc, you know, it's a little bit, it's not quite a narrative arc, but it is an arc of, um, you know, make me curious, give me some of the details and now give me an S, a next step. Where, where do I go from here? Uh, so RevThink has the RevThink or the Rev community, yep. which I joined last year, I believe. And I believe my, my personal favorite part is the fact that there are all these studio owners across the country, people that I look up to and, and respect or admire, that are having conversations. So Dryson, as a new studio owner who's like, I'm just trying to figure out what the F this whole studio ownership thing is, mm-hmm. <laughs> can hear conversations be a fly on the wall. What additional value do people at receive when they join the community perspective uh kindness <laughs> <laughs> right like sounding board i think what's cool about it is i've i've uh i'm gonna mention my buddy mitch again here because long ago gosh dare i even say more than 20 years ago um he he sort of coaxed out of me something that I hoped was true and that was that people are basically fundamentally good and even competitors in business in certain limited situations yeah they are rivals and they they will hate each other because ah they won that job and we didn't and we deserved it and you know there's this crazy mentality but if you appeal to the better angels of people's nature as the saying goes most people actually love to help and they love to seek out help. And the other ironic thing is you get a bunch of uh, competitors like in our community. And I think it's somewhere over 500 right now. It's amazing how rarely people actually compete. It's almost like this illusion of, Oh, well, if you do what I do, then I can't share with you because you're going to take what I have. That's a, that's such a myth. It's very much so that that rising tide raises all ships. All ships. That's exactly right. And we reference that that uh, saying often. So in Rev Community, it's this idea of hey, here's this private community where you as a business owner can join. You know, it's currently it's currently still free, and you're going to be in a community with really serious business owners. I mean, some of the like you mentioned, Aaron Sarovsky and people like at that level. And they're in there having conversations, talking about human resources, insurance policies, and of course, things like pitching and pricing and all this other stuff. And it's incredible how everyone is fundamentally open, sharing, commenting, because they know, one, it's safe, it's private. It's also curated by myself and and my team at RevThink and and Tim and I are both both in there. And so we're keeping an eye on things and making sure that um, it's all very uh, positive and, and honest and there's integrity and, and so forth. But that's the, really the benefit is that I would say that in your career, you move along this journey and the day that you recognize, whoa, I'm part of a community and that community is ultimately going to be the thing that fuels my career for the long term that's a that's a turning point yeah in your in your life because they've always been there now there's this mechanism or this platform where people can tap into that and there's all these other resources because as a consultancy of course 
we have courses and resources and materials and other things, um, private spaces, very private spaces for some of our clients we work with <clears throat> yeah. one-on-one and, and so forth. Um, but the, yeah, the biggest thing that you're going to benefit is, yeah, you're going to have the perspective um, and, and help and support of your peers. I love it. I love it. Uh, Joel, I just want to say thank you very much for being on the Frame One Podcast today. And if you're watching and have not liked or subscribed, you are missing out. Please do so. And uh, thanks for watching Frame One.